attempt to destabilize the ever-growing strength of the new Jedi Order. A trio of Sith assassins has ambushed one of the last remaining Jedi Force Masters. Their mission? Eliminate him, and through the new Jedi Order leadership into chaos. Face me, Jedi! I have no conflict with you, Sith. Perhaps not. But, however, your destruction will serve to cripple the Jedi Order. I see. And where are your two companions? Not far behind. But by the time they arrive, I will have your head. We shall see. No one loses their head today. I hope that that Jedi puts up a worthy fight when we find him. It would be good to have a true challenge. <laughs> you believe your skills to be matched for a Jedi Master. You should not underestimate my power, Master. Really? Show me. Shiva, did you locate the Jedi? She did, unfortunately for her. You will die today, Jedi. That's what she said. I told her I didn't want to fight. Unfortunately, Jedi. We do. I did not want this. Surrender now. Ha! You lack the will to destroy us, Jedi. I don't know don't need to destroy you in order to defeat you, for I am one with the Force. And the Force is with me. Please welcome Red Hat Executive Vice President and Chief People Officer, Delissa Alexander. May the fourth be with you. Good morning, everyone. 
Wow, it's been a great week. It's the last day, our grand finale of our Red Hat Summit. What an amazing week it's been. We've heard so many stories about the impact that individuals are having on the lives of others using, using open source technologies. And today, the conversation continues, starting with our Women in Open Source Awards. Red Hat created this award to highlight the role that women are playing in open source. And I'm excited and honored to be here today to be able to share the winners with you. The process looked like this. The community made nominations, many, many, and we had an outstanding set of finalists. And over 14,000 of us voted. Thank you for your participation. Two incredibly inspiring women who use open source to break down barriers and open doors are our winners. And I'm excited to be able to share them with you today. First, let me tell you a little bit about our academic award winner. At an age when most young women are just starting to think about entering the workforce, our winner is already sharing her mentorship with many, many young women in technology. A technologist herself, she was surprised when she went to university and saw so few female classmates. But rather than accepting the status quo, she decided to make a difference, becoming the director of the Delhi chapter of the Women Who Code, and also a me mentor for the organization Learn IT Girl. She's an open source contributor, contributing to the programming language Faro, and she's receiving research grants from around the globe, and she hasn't even graduated from college yet. Who's this woman? I'm gonna keep you in suspense while I share a little bit about our community award winner. This winner is an innovator and an activist. She believes that open source is a platform to break down traditional barriers. She leads the organization Kids on Computers, and she recently co-founded an open source platform called For a Living that allows students and professionals to connect to help the students think about their career possibilities. Other open source contributions include creating the framework that eventually became OpenACS and helping to co-lead the open source track at the Grace Hopper Conference. A longtime technologist, she recently joined Amazon on the Alexa team. Now it's my distinct honor to introduce you to our award winners. I believe that we rise by lifting others and by helping others step into this alluring world of open source has not only impacted them, but also it has created a ripple effect. I realized how much technology had changed my life, how much it had given me access to learning. I just wanted to help other kids who didn't have that access have access to it. My ultimate goal is to contribute something to this technological world and bring new people, especially more women, to this world of open source. had this dream of, of setting up computer labs in underprivileged areas or in developing areas. So I put in my five-year goal, I want to set up computer labs in developing countries. I went to this awesome conference, Grace Hopper Conference for Women in Computing, and I was so inspired by this conference of like 2,000 women. It was like amazing. So I came back and I looked at my one-year, five-year, and 10-year goals, and I was like, why do I have to wait five years to start doing this? Coming from an all-girls high school to a university, it was very discouraging to see the disconcerting sex ratio in my batch. This urge to change the perception led me to join many inspirational communities and tech societies. I just want to help bridge the gender gap in this world. I have helped set up these labs with the hopes that kids will be able to utilize the technology and get access to educational content that they don't otherwise have. We're hoping the kids will see what's possible and then come back and help improve their own lives, their families' lives, and their communities' lives. My vista of life where I'm associated with so many inspirational communities and tech societies not only provided an important pedestal for me to learn but also to give back to the community be it teaching kids uh, or teenage developers to start programming from scratch, 
to helping women shift their tracks to tech careers and then helping graduate female fellow developers to jump into the open source bandwagon working with different communities and helping people lift is what has created a ripple effect it has been a pretty exciting journey i think one thing you realize as you go on these trips is how much one trip can impact a community i think my my dreams have just become grander and my ambitions have become like i can really change the world Please join me in welcoming to the stage our 2017 Women in Open Source Award winners. First, our academic award winner, Jigyasa Rover. And now, our Community Award winner, Avni Khatri. Congratulations. And now we're going to step in the middle. This way, this way, this way. These are your 2017 Women in Open Source Award winners. Congratulations. Thank you. We're going to exit this way. Please welcome Red Hat Executive Vice President and Chief Marketing Officer, Tim Yaten. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to day three of the summit. Add my welcome to Delissa's. Um, so glad you could be here. Uh, for those of you who were at the Red Sox game, I hope you had a great time. Um, it was, I, I think, it was, re it was really a treat. Uh, yeah, it was a treat. I'm a, I'm a local guy, but it was really a treat to, to see all the red hats in the audience. And it was great to see how many of you made it on the jumbotron. I'm just a little worried how many of you remember that you were on the Jumbotron, since most of the pictures were like this. So, hope everybody had a good time. Um, so, I, uh, one other thing I'll just mention uh, at the outset. So, one of the things I like to do is to always be on brand. So, as you can tell, I've got my red uh, handkerchief, I've got red uh, belt, I've got my pin. But today, in deference to the Red Sox, my Red Sox are red socks. So, Oop. there we go. Okay, enough about me, um, uh, although I could go on if I had to, but um, the, today is really about uh, two things. You know, the theme of the summit is the impact of the individual. And one of the things that we've done as a company to start to highlight the impact of individuals is tell open source stories. Now, I've been in the industry for 37 years. Uh, I was around open source before we even called it that. In fact, a lot of the roots of open source come out of Unix, Unix collaboration, a lot of things that happened here at MIT and at Stanford. So if you look at the history of open source, it really started with licenses that made it easier to collaborate and share. But at that time, it was all about creating low-cost replicas of existing technologies. But something interesting happened over that period. As a technology industry, as a software industry, we learned how to collaborate. We learned how to collaborate in ways that we never thought of before. So fast forward to the last five or 10 years, most innovation that's happening in software is happening via upstream open source communities, um, like, like things we've never seen before in terms of cloud, mobility, AI. All these things are actually being innovated via open source communities. Well. That model of collaboration has now scaled well beyond software. In fact, it permeates almost every new human endeavor to solve big challenges, from healthcare to education to agriculture. So uh, it's become, it's moved from just a basic collaboration mechanism to build better software to the font of innovation for a technology, and most importantly now, 
the, the means and inspiration for t attacking some of the biggest problems that humankind faces. So with our uh, open source stories, we want to bring life to some of these amazing efforts that you know, ar around this notion of open source collaboration have caused great things to be done and great things to be pursued. Uh, now, interestingly enough, the first open source story we told was at the summit two years ago. And uh, it featured a person that we'll name Charlie. Now, that's good because his name really is Charlie. Um, but he, you know, he was uh, instrumental change agent at Penn Manor, uh, changing how kids learn by interacting with computers. And uh, you know, the story is amazing. And he's back two years uh, uh, since. Uh, to be able to, to share uh, the story of what uh, they accomplished. Uh, and we want to recognize him as an example of, you know, the impact of the individual. A single person with lots of passion uh, and, and lots of stick to fundamentally changed how students were learning and how they were inspired. And so uh, with that as backdrop, I'd like to cue the video. We know that learning is a system of trial and error, of failures, right? The system is telling our teachers and our students it's not OK to fail. Sometimes they're going to fail spectacularly, but that's how you learn and that's how you grow. When I think of Charlie, I think about the very first time. My introduction to Penn Manor was one of my very first meetings. And in walks this guy that has hair like uh, Malcolm Gladwell. It's got this I, I joke with him that if he ever got a cut, he'd have to rebrand himself. But one of the things that amazed me about Charlie in that first meeting is he wasn't just somebody who ran the tech. He took the time to explain to a room full of teachers how the technology worked, why it was able to do what it did. Knowing the back end and knowing how these things work allowed us to think about how do we use this in our classroom or how could this be effective. Education is without a doubt the most important human endeavor. I mean, everything flows from education, from, from learning. Several years ago, we began discussing the feasibility of issuing one laptop for every one of our students. We've given our students tremendous trust and responsibility and the ability to customize their own machines. And, and that's quite unusual for a public school to, to follow that trajectory. Well, I'm Kyle Smith and I go to Manor Middle School. I am 13 years old and I love to program. Charlie taught me programming for um, websites and how to program a C file. And I have taught my friend how to do that now. I've learned a lot of complicated programming languages now. Ruby, Python, Java. Um, I'm probably a an expert at HTML now. I'm going to go to Penn Manor High School. There's a student help desk, and I'm definitely going to work there. Charlie's infectious. He makes you want to strive to not have the kids be bored. It's always, what can I do to help? How can we get rid of the typical paper pencil in your classroom? And I just love how it's changed me as a teacher, it wouldn't be possible if Charlie didn't introduce this one-to-one -one laptop program and convince us that it would work. But it's not about a curriculum or a computer or a software. Everywhere we look, we have people who are curious, who are investigating, who are taking something and making it better. That's what I think Charlie brings to the table. He brings a passion for learning and a power for transforming our schools into something better than it is today. By unlocking devices and giving kids truly open technology, it empowers them to not only understand what's underneath the hood, but understand that they can impact the world. So, and, and just like Charlie and the leadership he showed and the inspiration he brought to all those kids, you know, many of you in the room do the same things for your organizations. You're pioneers and champions of open source and of a lot bigger ideas to help move society forward. So uh, before we proceed, I'd just like to uh, uh, let you know that uh, Charlie's here. 
uh, as is Mike Licklider, uh, both from uh, the Penn School, and we just wanted to honor him as sort of the embodiment of the individual impact. So, Charlie. So, uh, Charlie, just one thought, though. Um, we'd really like to get Kyle's resume because we're always looking for HTML5 and Java expertise. So, awesome. Thank you. So uh, we wanted to just uh, highlight all that work. You know, after two years, you know, you look at the inspiration in, in those children. You know, the way they're acclimating to programming and STEM. You know, it's, it's just awesome. So thanks to you both. You know, keep it up. You know, we're going to be rooting for you, and hopefully we'll see an, an update in another two years. So thank you. Okay. Um, next thing we'd like to do is talk about what we're going to do from here in terms of these stories. So as I mentioned. Our concept of open source stories is to bring to life bigger uh, ideas that uh, fall out of the open source collaboration style model. And we've got two new stories that we want to uh, introduce you to you today. The first is Alicia Gibb. She's executive director and founder of the Open Source Hardware Foundation, which is helping to drive the future of physical systems. And also Caleb Harper, who is principal investigator and director of the Open Art Agriculture uh, uh, inst Initiative driven out of MIT uh, right here in, uh, in Greater Boston and Cambridge. So these are two examples, uh, new examples that you're going to hear from live today of similarly uh, powerful stories of how open collaboration can change other elements in our lives. So with that, uh, enjoy uh, our, our two next speakers and enjoy the last day of the conference. Thank you very much. Please welcome Open Source Hardware Association founder and executive director, Alicia Gibb. Hi, I'm Alicia Gibb and I am so honored to be here. I'm the executive director of the Open Source Hardware Association, and some of you may recognize me. I've also been helping solder badges uh, with little LEDs out at the BTU lab and Open, Store, open Source Stories booth. Um, so if you haven't gotten a chance, please come out there. We've put some uh, kits at your chairs, so some of you already have the kits that you need to solder together, and you can come see us or take those home with you. But first, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got here. So I got my start in library and information science, where we were taught a strong understanding of freedom of information. That ported naturally to open source for me, which I learned about for the first time when I learned that you could right click on a web page and view the source. Yeah. So I was blown away. I thought, this is freedom of information. I instantly traded my books for code and microcontrollers. And I found myself enmeshed in a world of hackers as I was one of the foundational members of NYC Resistor, a hackerspace in Brooklyn in 2008. I loved the motto, we learn, share, and make things. I had found my community. I wrote my art history thesis on the Arduino microcontroller. I started a job at an open source hardware company. And I founded the Open Source Hardware Summit. All of this led to founding the Open Source Hardware Association in 2012. We like to call it Oshawa for short. And I'm proud to be here representing the nonprofit that brings open source to a new layer of our products. Together, I'm hoping that we can create an open source future. But first, before we did anything, the open source hardware community had to create a definition. So we did what any good open source group does. We started an email list. Business owners and hobbyists agreed on these six attributes as what you needed to do to call your hardware open source and apply this gear logo. And over the years, we realized that we needed to add some clarifications. So we came up with this checklist. One of the things on this checklist includes are you emotionally prepared to be copied? We had to make this addition because people would email us saying, I open sourced my hardware and somebody copied me. Help, what are you going to do about it? And we would say, congratulations, you successfully created open source hardware. 
But that wasn't the answer they wanted to hear. They were expecting something a little different. And I think this is happening because we have people coming from the product side who haven't yet been involved in an open source project or an open source community. But this is really exciting because this means that overall, we're reaching more people. And speaking of reaching more people, many of you have probably heard of or played with the Arduino microcontroller. This is one of the most successful pieces of open source hardware. And although the open source hardware was started with ham radio, the Arduino now has given open source to many industries across the board. It was originally created for artists, designers, and educators, but now has, has been ported to projects like the Open Curiosity Project at NASA, or humanitarian projects like SafeCast, which is an open source Geiger counter that was used after the Fukushima disaster. The Arduino has been copied hundreds of times, and it's important to remember that Arduino was a derivative itself. And it reminds us that it's OK to be copied. We should use the potential of the whole community and build on each other's ideas. My favorite derivative is the purple circular one that has petal-looking things around the circumference. It's called the lily pad, and it's the first wearable microcontroller. So the little petals around the circumference are so that you can sew it into clothing with conductive thread. This is created by Leah Beakley, who is getting her PhD at CU Boulder. And lucky for Leah, there is an open hardware company right up the road to manufacture her goods. This is my favorite example, because I just really doubt that the Arduino team would have ever considered making a microcontroller that you could sew into clothing. Arduino's open source philosophies have led straight into classrooms, R&D labs, and hackerspaces. There's new ways of learning that have emerged as kids can now play with electronics and robots and hands-on classrooms around the country. And R&D labs are making strides in new discoveries, such as this bodysuit that's enabled with a lily pad that helps people with paralysis learn to walk again. This is an example of, as Red Hat says, thinking the open source way. This is our present day reality in open source hardware. We have everything from open source tractors to open source fashion. Fashion's a really interesting industry to have open source in. Fashion can't be copyrighted or patented. So it's already, in a way, inherently open source. So when creators put the open source hardware logo on it, it's really trying to show the true intention of the company and how they want the users using that product. It's often said with open source that if we couldn't have patents, industries would fail. But what happens in an industry where you're not allowed to have patents or copyright? They innovate four times a year with a summer, fall, winter, and spring collection. Now, I couldn't talk holistically about open source if I didn't mention the Internet of Things. And this here is the thing, as in Internet of. The Internet of Things is the poster child between software, hardware, and data coming together. And with IoT, open source hardware will be important to security, just as open source software has been to, well, you know, everything. With hardware, we need to share the responsibility of security. And the future of, open, of IoT is already enormous. So let's make that future open source together. There are, of course, other useful applications in open source hardware and IoT. For example, this Wi-Fi-enabled flamethrower. But you never know when a slightly silly project will be the next inspiration for why the Mars rover is able to land safely. I mentioned the BTU lab earlier, which is a lab that I direct at CU Boulder. And I have students, and they're making all kinds of silly things every day, from an analog internet literally made out of a series of tubes to an Amazon button that instead of sending you Tide when you push it, it prints you a cat from the internet. And what excites me most about that is the potential that these students have to transfer that knowledge. This is the open PCR. I used to believe people when they told me that open source hardware would never stand a chance in the medical industry. And then this came along. It copies your DNA. 
Hospitals spend tens of thousands of dollars on machines like these. But this one, you can put it together yourself. It's $599, and you can buy it on Amazon. With more innovations like these with open source, we can hope to make the medical industry open source as well. Thanks to DIY Bio and 3D Prosthetics, the FDA is also taking note of open source hardware. I was fortunate enough to meet a representative from the FDA at the White House last summer when I went there to speak on open manufacturing. They told me that the FDA isn't really interested in stopping people from personalizing their own devices. They realize that this is going to happen. So instead, they're trying to educate communities like the open source hardware community on their failure mode analysis and on the quality systems regulation to help everybody create better devices together. This is incredible that a government entity has taken note of open source hardware. And this brings me to suspending reality a little bit. So we've seen the amalgamation of hardware and software coming together, right? It's been happening for years. But when we talk about source in open source hardware, we have to suspend reality a little bit. This is what I call the atoms versus bits conundrum. With the source in hardware, you don't always get the product, although 3D printers are making that easier. And with a little more research in 3D printing, I hope that we'll be able to print components, or maybe we could even turn our 3D printers into desktop chip fabs. This would really push the IC industry further open source if people could create them at home. Currently, most ICs that we deal with in open source hardware are closed. So there's a layer of the source that's not able to be open. We also don't know where our raw materials come from. So far, the atomic layer isn't one that the open source community has termed important enough to be considered in our source. And perhaps that won't matter until we have interstellar space travel where Earth copper is different from Nimbus 3 copper. One of the other biggest things in differences in, in hardware versus software is copyright versus patent. So our biggest ask to date at Oshawa has been for a certification program, which we came out with last year. And one of the reasons that we came out with this is that we started to have Fortune 500 companies asking for something with a little bit more legal teeth in it. Um, so the way that the law works with hardware versus software is copyright versus patent. And all of you know that it's pretty easy to license something under copyright. With hardware, it is very difficult to license something without a patent. And our community doesn't want to go get a patent just to license it openly. So Oshawa came up with a hack. We created this trademarked logo. And although it's couched in trademark, you can still apply it to your hardware board. And it adds some protections where it fits in nicely with some of what the Fortune 500 company lawyers were telling us that they needed. It also creates a database of open source hardware projects with links to their source. Next time you're working on an open hardware project, we really hope that you certify it. We want to gain your support for open source hardware, and we want to give you a little bit of support through the certification. The more we band together, acknowledge our overlaps, and develop in unison, the more the community becomes open source. If we dream of an open source world, that world includes physical products. We need to be thinking more holistically, but we need help from the FOSS community to do that. So next time you're playing with a piece of hardware, ask yourself, is there an open source alternative available? Thanks. Please welcome the Principal Investigator and Director of the Open Agriculture Initiative at the MIT Media Lab, Caleb Harper. Hello. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited to sit in front of all of you and give you so much work to do. So get ready. All right, let's go forward. There we go. So if you don't know the MIT Media Lab, I thought I'd give you a little bit of a brief about it. I lead a group there. Um, inside of the lab, there are 30 labs. We share no content. Uh, in common, what we share, which was mentioned previously, is suspended disbelief of anything. Uh, they call us the anti-disciplinary, 
Uh, MIT says we have no discipline. Uh, but inside, we chase after dreams. One of those dreams is Professor Hugh Hare's work. Hugh uh, lost his legs when he was a young man. He's been building and rebuilding his own legs for the last 20 years. And when you talk to Hugh, you'll say, oh, this is great that you know, disabled people can walk again. And he says, no, this is human 2.0. I make myself taller on dates. I make myself shorter to ride on planes. I put picks in my feet to climb mountains. And so <clears throat> in addition to that, there's another group. If you remember that toy where you put your hand through one side and it came out the other, they wanted to do teleportation. So they said, OK, we'll create a device where anywhere in the world you can, you can manipulate an object. So what they created is called Inform. You can see it's using computer vision, replicating those hands inside of a dynamic platform. So literally, you can be anywhere in the world and play with the ball. So that brings me to my work. If I said the word food crisis to you, it's likely that even all these people in this room would be thinking something different. Not enough food, too much food, algal blooms and oceans, food security, GMO is a curse, GMO is the savior. There's not enough water, we're polluting our rainforest, we're cutting them down, the land of the farmer is being taken, a uh, small shareholder farmer. I try to create a derivative in my work. How old do you think the average apple is in a United States grocery store, from the date it was picked till the date it got in your mouth? Two months, six months, 14 months. At 14 months, 90% of the antioxidants of that apple have, are gone. It's basically a little ball of sugar and cellulose fiber. So we're on the verge of a revolution in agriculture because our system is starting to fail. The first one changed society fundamentally for forever. We're no longer hunters and gatherers. We're now farmers. Second one, agricultural revolution, the base of technology-based societies. Third one, rapid urbanization that created all of our cities. So what will the fourth one have? The fourth one will have a climate democracy. And what I mean by that is this map, the most beneficial climates in agriculture are in blue, the least in red. They move and they change, and we're slave to climate. One of the big questions of my work is, can we start being a designer of climate? Can we put Napa in India, Bordeaux in Africa? The second one, super serious as always, can we make Wonka vision? So take that candy bar, process it, send it through the air, and reconstitute it on the other side. Or in another way, in a world where Pokemon Go had more users than Twitter and Tinder combined in a week, can we not take data to describe physical objects that we eat, send them through the air instead of shipping them, and reconstitute them with the same properties? And the last one, I went to Fukushima after the disaster. When I landed, it said, the headline that day, Japanese agriculture has no money, no youth, no land, and no future. But it isn't just Japan. In the United States, 2% of us are involved in agriculture. The average age of a farmer, 58. The next generation, not standing there in line, not seeing a future that they can participate in. Half of the continental population of Africa, under 18. 80% don't want to be farmers. They don't see a life that's, that, that they can live, that they've seen their grandparents suffer through. So we've got to create a billion more farmers. So we need a movement. We've seen coder movement, obviously. Thank you, everyone. We've seen maker movement. We're in the middle or pretty far advanced. We've seen network movement. This is why Uber is now doing what it's doing, and obviously Airbnb and all that stuff. We're up next for the bio movement. In a lab that never had anything to do with biology, the media lab, we now have six out of 30 labs doing biology. The convergence of life science of the digital world and bio is happening at a rate that I don't think anyone knows uh, exactly where it's going to go. Movements need tools, so I've been developing tools for climate democracy. Uh, inside of this little lab, this was five years ago, there's a lot of cool technology and I'll talk about it. But I think most interesting thing, 60 square feet in the media lab produced a harvest once a month. We took all of those plants out and we, started, we, we created a pick your own lettuce patch for nerds. In this lettuce patch, we had roboticists, data scientists, algorithms experts starting to see these bright white roots, these deep green colors, and get inspired to do something about it. So in that process, I used to take the plants out, bring them back into the lab if there was some left over, because if you grew it, you're proud of it. And it would taste sweeter the next day. So I got mad at all of my students, and I put up cameras, and I thought they were doing things to mess with me. But it turns out I was a technologist falling backwards into plant physiology. A plant under stress creates biochemical change. It's defense mechanisms. So I thought if we could code climate, then we could code flavor and nutrition. 
So then we built this lab uh, a couple years ago now. Inside of this lab, there are 30 network sensing points per plant, things like CO2, O2, temperature, humidity, light. If you know about the genome, I'm talking about the phenome, or the phenomena, that if I had a digital twin, that or a physical twin, and he worked out a little bit more and he ate differently, he might look different, he would certainly taste different. That's the exact same thing that's going on inside of this environment. So we've grown all kinds of things with all different technologies to reduce water consumption, to increase speed of, speed of grow. We've used ancient and rare genetics like these tomatoes from Svalvord, never been eaten in 150 years. Bring them back to life. Search through them for what they have to give people rather than what they have to supply to fit a supply chain. Those environments are very big, and what I needed is not bigger environments, I needed more instances. So we created something we call the personal food computer. We put that food computer out with a Unity-based uh, game. That game had a digital environment, it was linked to a physical environment, and it had sensors and actuators. The kids chose a recipe that was created by somebody else, actuated it in their food computer, and then they get curious. How much CO2? How much humidity? Why does a plant need CO2 anyway? Crank down CO2, plant dies, kid learns a lesson. In the meantime, they harvest the plant for physically and then digitally. That digital harvest creates a derivative recipe. They've now started mapping the phenome or the ability of that plant to express. I gotta go faster. All right, we've put it into schools. The craziest thing that happened is we had a teacher build the climate of the past using farmer's almanac data, using real-time data, build the climate of the present, and using predictive models from Watson, build the climate of the future. So it's a lot more interesting than the biology I took, which is why I became an architect. <laughs> We're building this lab right now uh, out at the old linear accelerator at MIT. We're just scaling up the work. We launched the version 2.0 food computer at the White House a few months ago. It's, uh, it's awesome, you'll see. Data. This hardware produces phenome data, and we do it non-invasively, so we're using things like computer vision, we're using sp uh, mass spectrometers, we're using uh, this brain box, this brain box all open source, all running uh, on all the things you know. We then do invasive testing. We say, OK, terroir, what's terroir? We unpack that. We figure out, what are all the minerals? We take the water and we sequence it. And we say, what's the root microbiome of this plant? We take the plant forward and we do gas chromatography and mass spec to say, these things that you're looking at that seem super weird, these little compounds, that's flavor. That's a secondary metabolite that the plant has produced as a reaction to stress. So we're trying to figure all of that out. That amounts to about three and a half million data points per plant per grow. We call that the recipe. We put the recipe in, we have an interface for you to check it out, and it goes into the robot. Actually, part of our system is designed on ROS, so it makes a whole lot of sense. That robot can then do things, create data that we do machine learning and artificial intelligence on. When you're talking about the vast number of variables and the vast number of expressions, this has never been mapped in human history. So we've started going through that. What you see on one side is kind of a multivariable analysis of all of that with a heat map. We say, how do we make it bigger? We get a trending heat map of three corollary data sets that no one ever knew before. We can then take that forward, do visualizations of it. We even create models and run real-time real weather data to predict where yield would be in the world. We did our first one about a month ago. We were 75% accurate based on historic data from the FAO and historic data from uh, weather stations for the last 30 years. You might think I'm crazy and maybe this isn't coming anytime soon. It's already happening on the space station. Space program's been doing it for a long time, in fact. But it has landed on Earth. This is a factory in Japan. They call it Plant Factory. It's like the worst name you could ever call something. Uh, it does a million heads of lettuce, 365, uh, one week uh, every day of the year. But you've maybe heard about the lettuce part of vertical farming or control environment ag, but maybe you haven't heard about the next one. If we can go back, well, there we go, play that video. What do you think is growing in here? Looks kind of similar to my lab. Don't know, little tiny plant. Ebola vaccine. So this is a DARPA project that's using tobacco, tobacco mosaic virus to produce an Ebola vaccine. This is one of the reasons we got ahead of Ebola in Sierra Leone. This, plants give us everything. Pharmaceutical natural derivatives, cosmetics, nutraceuticals, all the way down to the things that you think about and the things that you eat. So this brings me to my last point, and I'm already over time, so get stoked, because this is about you. 
we put everything out open source, uh, GPL 2.0, Creative Commons on the hardware, even though we don't have a better option, and Mozilla Science Data License. We put everything on Wiki. We created this community. The community, as you know, is raucous. Uh, they're throwing all their, <laughs> their ideas in there, um, usually asking me for an answer. If you're watching, I have no answers. Uh, so join the community forum. Please come in, start learning. We've put this out in schools. We developed a climate creator from scratch, if you know scratch. So this is our user interface right now where you design climates uh, across different things. Kids have been building this in what they call homebrew food computer clubs, if that doesn't make you a little bit curious. The last one we've deployed now with the UN in a Syrian refugee camp in Amman. We didn't tell them what to grow. They decided to grow things that they miss from home things that they can't get anymore. It became a cultural object more than just a manufacturing object. So the community has grown in one year. We've been holding these hackathons inside of the Media Lab. This was 150 high school students that went, went home, created their own chapter of Open Ag. Without any money, with a very bad back end, with a community that's raucous, we are in 40 countries on six continents with builds. So we had to create a foundation. This is how we're working now. Everything goes out of MIT open source, collected by the Open Ag Foundation as the commons, and then made available for commercialization. And you guys know a thing or two about that. This is the world today. Any country in a color is, is food insecure, meaning they do not produce enough food within their national boundary to feed their domestic population. Any color, red. With a purple overlay, these are countries that are not food secure that produce food for other countries. Mexico and us. China is the largest landholder in Brazil. The Middle East gets all of its food from Central Africa. Those strings that you see just barely with the dots, product of the Industrial Revolution. Cars, planes, trains, automobiles. We ship our food a very long way. And, and if you don't know, when you harvest a plant to when you eat the plant is how much it has to give you back, just like the apple. This is the future. If you can see those little points, this is where we're growing food to create data and recipe shape, to email it to each other across the world, to get rid of shipping, to get rid of nutrition attenuation. Uh, and this future is already built, being built right now, and I really need your help. Thank you. Innovative technology is really important to Barclays because we can't stand still. We exist because our customers need services from us. We've got to innovate and keep up with the times and be ahead of the times in order to secure that marketplace and that's, that's what we're here for. We're just on the cusp of an architectural change towards containerized platform. We've got a vibrant, thriving tech industry. We have real need for innovation in the, in the public service, and we have sponsorship to pursue that innovation. El proyecto de modernización y automatización de aplicaciones en el gobierno del estado de Jalisco consistió en hacer un cambio de paradigma. Entonces buscamos un, un sentido de innovación abierta, en el cual eh, Red Hat nos ayuda a acceder a una comunidad, a una comunidad de colaboración y de co-creación. We're delivering a production-ready platform for our customers. If you think of the level of collaboration and uh, constant conversations and, and work that we've done together, it's great to have such a tight relationship and a partnership with Red Hat. The impact is going to be massive on uh, business banking, wealth management, and the personal banking areas, thanks to Red Hat Technologies. Please welcome Red Hat Vice President of Customer Experience and Engagement, Marco Bill Peter. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. It's funny what Tim remembered about the Red Sox game. I felt like back home in Switzerland standing on a glacier. It was so cold. <laughs> now, this half an hour here is really about you know, our innovation awards. You heard throughout the whole week from Paul, from Jim, uh, 
about our five winners here. And these awards recognize technology achievements of our customers and partners worldwide. As you last year saw, we had worldwide participation. We have it this year as well. And all these winners, they really demonstrate creative thinking, you know, determined problem solving, innovative use of our Red Hat solutions, and execution, right? All these awards are real, right? There's is proof points behind it. And all these categories, they combine. It's not just technology. It's technology and the culture. How can you do that, right? We're going through an evolution. And a lot of these winners, all of these winners have shown these transformations. Now, the categories are DevOps, application optimization, cloud infrastructure, enterprise transformation, and the best use of open source way or the open source way. Based on what happened uh, earlier this year at the Oscars, we want to be a bit more transparent about how we judge. I think this will help you to understand it better as well. We have a total of seven judges. Two, unfortunately, couldn't be here for personal reasons. Five are here. And each category has one winner that judges selected during the nomination process. So we get lots of nomination. We go through all these nominations. It's an an amazing experience to read about all this innovation that's happening around the world. Five winners get selected for each category, or one each category. And remember, today at the end of the keynote, one of these five winners will be announced as the 2017 Innovator of the Year. Now, let's get the other judges on to join me on the stage, please. Now, awards, the award judges <laughs> include a diverse group of talented professionals. Some are Red Hatters, as you probably recognize, Chris Wright and Ashesh. But then also we have a customer, the previous winner of the Innovation Award, uh, Mar from Amadeus, and actually also experts from outside, as in technical uh, analysts or, or press as well. So we have Chris Rommels representing that. <coughs> now, Many of these judges actually work throughout the journey of these customers or these partners in their innovation. So they have a lot of insights in how actually that journey happened. And so what we want to do is a little panel here and kind of have a few questions on how they, how they see it, how these uh, winners actually went through the journey. All of these winners have obviously solutions from Red Hat. They're using innovative products from us. They've used our <laughs> services and you, you know at Red Hat, we don't just sell technology and the license. We sell you a subscription around open source, right? You remember that? The subscription includes, obviously, support, which I represent, but then also documentation, product security, the life cycle. That's all the value. And then Red Hat also provides, as you know, training. You had the opportunity to do certifications here. But then also the great consulting team that you've seen yesterday, a very innovative Swiss story, which I was really proud of. Now, let me sit down here, and let's uh, start here with, um, you know, like Paul Cormier mentioned in his Tuesday keynote, right, DevOps is changing how enterprise develop and launch applications and services. Now, similar to the process in the open source communities, right, DevOps focuses on collaboration to achieve business goals using IT resources. Let me ask Ashesh, our expert here, how is the industry embracing DevOps? Thanks, Marco. So this is an extremely important topic um, that we see a lot of discussion in the industry uh, today. Um, and I think the industry has struggled with a few things in the past, which is why we've seen the advent, the embrace of DevOps. Um, from a development perspective, we've found 77% um, of projects are considered challenged or failed. Um, about half of developers lack significant cloud development experience. Uh, and only 23% of developers are confident with the technology choices they've made. All right, and that's on the development side, right? From an operations perspective, um, what we found are other challenges as well, right? We've found that uh, the cost um, for a large-scale app um, that's been written when it goes down, you know, it's very significant, <coughs> right? The average time to diagnose or repair an issue is about 200 minutes or so. Um, there's an average of 750 defects in a 50,000-line Java application. Uh, and of course, when this does go down, it costs about $42,000 or so per hour. Mm -hmm. So I just you know, rattled off a series of stats to give a sense of the magnitude of the challenge and then obviously the opportunity that arises. 
um, for us to solve it. Um, but these are just the technical hurdles I've talked about here. You know, I think we could maybe ask someone like Dietmar, you know, what he thinks from uh, uh, an organizational perspective or behavioral change perspective um, that needs to be addressed here. Yeah, so I, I believe here we, we talk a lot about collaboration. Huh? So it's, it's important to get the different teams together. The, I mean, the operational teams, the R&D teams, uh, development and business, business people coming together. So D DevOps is really a, a tool uh, to foster collaboration. And by, by this, it's, it's a cultural change agent. Mm -hmm. huh? it's, it's really important uh, that uh, we get the teams together to have uh, more productivity. Uh, uh, earlier discussions and knowledge sharing at the end. Right. So in, in our case, I, I can, there are many examples. I can single out one that, that is currently running, a large project to revisit and re-engineer to some degree our, our e-commerce platform. That's a huge piece of software used by many, many airlines out there. And what we have been doing is exactly in this spirit, putting the different teams together, uh, ev everyone from the very beginning on and so it, it, it creates uh, energy, and it creates uh, common knowledge, uh, and it creates pride. And at the end, it's all about uh, culture, really. Uh, and it's, it's a tool to implement this collaborative culture. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Dietmar. Thank you, Ashesh. Let me ask you one question or more specific to the Barclay success story that we heard, right? Um, they are their application platform as a service solution was their, you know, the success of that was really the ability to shift to more innovative, more agile DevOps approach. How did Red Hat help here, and what can the audience learn from that, Ashesh? Sure, so you know, I've personally spent a lot of time with the Barclays team, and they've been on a remarkable journey um, <coughs> over several <coughs> years. Um, but let's just talk about the, the macro perspective for a minute. Um, the financial services industry is faced of a lot of regulatory pressure, um, and of course there's market volatility, you know, we all know that. Um, increasingly we find new FinTech disruptors that are entering the market. Uh, and as a result, um, organizations like Barclays want to become more agile than they've been in the past to develop new applications, take advantage of existing investments. Uh, and we've consistently seen that on the journey that Barclays has been on with Red Hat, right? We have a long history together, uh, you know, with regard to their adoption of the enterprise Linux technologies, Aurel, uh, our JBoss technologies, uh, and building uh, the APAS, the application platform as a service on uh, Red Hat's OpenShift uh, platform has been a natural extension of that. Uh, we find um, that they were doing many more frequent releases for new services, uh, and they were able to have much more support for bridging the old with the new, right? This is the balancing the existing investment uh, with the new microservices-based uh, application that they were uh, building. Um, again, an opportunity for collaboration between, you know, dev and ops teams. Um, one thing, though, that's important to note is, you know, OpenShift and container technology is still, you know, relatively new with regard to uh, wide-scale industry adoption. Um, they're likely to be growing pains, you know, as we go on the journey. Um, so I almost feel sometimes for customers around the problem, um, <laughs> technology is obviously something that needs to be overcome, but could almost be, you know, the easier of the problems um, that they face. Um, and as Dietmar alluded to, that the real challenge is cultural, right? How do you shift from large drops of software that happen maybe on a every six-month basis or quarterly basis to incremental releases? Um, how do you go um, to embrace this culture of failing fast, being able to deliver continuously? Um, organizations like Barclays, and Barclays is a splendid example of this, are embracing DevOps, right, in, in the public cloud um, and thinking differently about technology and business infrastructure. Um, and these teams that, you know, need to work together, right, they need to uh, become familiar with the technology that they're using, the new technology that they're adopting, but also being able to collaborate across boundaries. It's great what they achieved, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So Dietmar, with, with you know, cl your last win, last year's win, right, there's a, you using OpenShift uh, container platform as well. What similarities do you see between Barclay's story and your, your story at Amadeus? So wh when I've read the, the Barclay uh, proposition, <coughs> a lot of things reminded me to the journey we are, we are going through. So yes, we, we go massively on OpenShift, uh, as, as you know. So the, the, the challenges to master the technology are very similar. And uh, the, the feedbacks from the teams and, and, and the gains at the end are that we have faster releasing on the platform, and the, the teams are kind of freed from looking to the underlying technical stack because that's, that's now managed by, by, the, by the platform uh, itself. Huh? So they are, they are focusing more on the, uh, on the releasing, on the business side of things, which is what we really want them to do. Huh? So all of this has come with challenges, but also with a great uh, level of energy and, and uh, 
an adoption that is strong, so it's good. And it's also worthwhile to mention that it, it was important and it's still important for us to have a strong partner helping us because on the technical side and on the implementation of DevOps, we have had many, many questions. So having Red Hat with us and, and other, other companies playing in this game is, is very important. So. Yeah, I think um, uh, that's it's correct, right? <coughs> having a partnership and real collaboration between mm. partners, it's not just a supplier uh, no. relationship. It's, it's good, yeah. Now, it's not just the financial sector where cultural shifts are happening, right? And, and increasingly necessary and pretty common, right? It the potential is in any industry, as you can tell, right? Um, and, you know, as we just said, collaboration is one of the most important elements in the open source way. Now, it's very exciting to see large, previously a bit more isolated organization like the government of British Columbia taking advantage of DevOps collaboration in an open way. Now, let me go back to you, Dietman, right? That um, what has the Amadeus experience been with embracing the open source software, but then also the open source technology in the open source way? Be careful, I can talk for hours on this. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we have a long history in open source usage. Uh, so I mean, we, we use Linux, uh, like, like I guess most of us here, for, for ages. Uh, so we, we are not completely new to this. But uh, a few years back, uh, the, I, I would say our relation to open source changed, uh, where we, we, we got more, more active and we looked more actively into projects. Uh, and when we took the decision to go with OpenShift, we, we, we took it also, obviously, because it's an open source uh, layer and the uh, under underlying Kubernetes uh, software is fully open. And we, we did act actively with your teams uh, participate to the evolution of Kubernetes. So we, we could contribute to, to this environment, which, which creates on our side a very deep sense of ownership and knowledge of the platform, which is very important for critical systems. Yeah. Uh, when, when you, have, you have to understand what you're doing uh, if you have to react very fast to problems. Uh, and I think it's also a, a, a matter of, of really embracing the, the open source spirit. I mean, we profit a lot from the community. We, 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 we get collective knowledge into our products. Uh, we have a lot of knowledge, and I think we, we owe to some degree to the community to, to hand back and to, to, shift, to ship contributions that we believe are of common interest to everyone. That's what a community really is. I mean, if, it, if, a, if in a community everyone is only consuming, you can't construct society or, or, or any, any positive thing around the community. So we, we try to take this uh, seriously, and that's, that's what we think we have to do, really. Yeah? Yeah, that's admirable. Really embracing the open source mm. spirit and contributing back, in, engaging open source is great. Now. <laughs> uh, Collaboration can come from many sources, right? And Ashesh, I know you worked with the, the government of the British Columbia quite closely to build the Developers Exchange. On you worked on their journey, right? To help them on the journey to become more collaborative and partner, and how they partner with the private sector to improve the services to the clients, right? Can you tell us a bit more about this story and and why they were selected for the award for the open source way? Sure. So I'm really um, glad to see British Columbia being recognised. Uh, for the work they've been doing here uh, for at least a couple of reasons, right? One is they've been extremely thoughtful about what they want to do. Um, it's about, you know, trying to empower um, developers, essentially um, individual citizens, um, to be able to use technology for the common good. Um, and that's, that's really great. Um, you know, we've had them be an active participant in the OpenShift Commons, uh, you know, which again, you know, speaks to the power of uh, community and collaboration. Uh, and, and that's been uh, really great to see. Uh, and also, it's appropriate for them, uh, given the theme of this year's conference, right, which is celebrating the impact of the individual. Uh, I think the work that uh, British Columbia is doing really is about trying to um, have each individual make a greater impact. Um, so the open source um, way is really about using open source to create that culture um, to support the collaboration. Right, so we talk a lot about businesses having uh, flexibility and agility to, uh, to compete. Uh, and to be able to rapidly develop IT initiatives and embrace uh, DevOps. Uh, and I think the British Columbia Developers Exchange is off to a really good start. Uh, you know, we already heard about you know, some of the things that you know, are happening uh, from the videos that we've seen earlier this week. Uh, what OpenShift really is doing and the technology platform that we provide is supporting that collaborative approach, right? Uh, helping to reduce time between proposing new applications to actually developing and deploying them. Um, that's extremely powerful, right, to amplify the impact um, of the individual. Um, these projects highlight the power of the openness and collaboration that we've talked about. 
Um, and you know, there's some really great examples, right? You know, one example that I personally um, liked a lot was the Ministry of Transportation Infrastructure um, developing the school bus inspection tracking service. I think we saw a quick picture of that um, earlier this week. Um, the system was built and launched in just eight weeks. Right? Absolutely remarkable, right? Because previously it might have taken a year. And again, you know, unlocking the power um, of the individuals who collaborated on that. Um, another project that showed the work that they did also with the private sector, right? So we're in a really expanding out the ecosystem was the highway camera project. Uh, Peter Wat Watkins actually talked about um, this, right? He's the executive director um, over at uh, BC Dev Exchange um, during the keynote yesterday. And uh, he really talked about, you know, the opportunities that they had to be able to create an open 511 API for road events, right? Allowing um, departments to work with a local software firm, right? To uh, expand, you know, others who can collaborate on this. Uh, to build an app that offers more information uh, and really be able to have technology companies provide improved services for citizens. Uh, that truly is a great example of the open source way and collaborating. Thank you, Ashesh. I think having a government publishing open APIs is just so Thanks. remarkable. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Now, broad availability of open source projects you know, in the community, right, means opportunity for governments to connect with innovation, with open innovation, and provide better services for citizens. Another similar government open source story is here in the app application optimization category with our, with, we recognize the government of the state of Jalisco and Mexico for using an agile approach to achieve superior performance in creating, maintaining, and deploying business applications. So you see, you see we have Canada, we have Mexico. Now, <laughs> let me ask Chris Wright, there's no wall in between. Chris Wright, let me ask Chris, why are the governments like Jalisco so keen to adopt an open source first strategy for projects like application optimization? Well, there's a lot of benefits that we've already talked about here about collaboration, you know, empowering the individual, but I think uh, there's a really important aspect that's just about the, the operational efficiency of, of running, uh, whether it's a business or in this case a government. So you bring this open source innovation and technology, uh, it's really enabling the government to, to be more efficient, to lower costs, and embrace agility. So ju just the same uh, situation you'd see in an enterprise and specifically <clears throat> at Jalisco, they've brought together some Red Hat technologies, including uh, you know, JBoss, EAP, and Fuse, and RHEL, and Rev, to, to really uh, cut their operational costs significantly. So for them, we've seen a 60% reduction in cost, uh, and uh, also at the same time, in operational cost, and at the same time, really significantly cutting the hardware costs. So great cost efficiency. Along with that, they're able to serve uh, a thousand percent more citizens. So going from uh, 3,000 citizens per day to 30,000 citizens per day in terms of transactions between citizens and the government. And maybe not the most exciting kind of way to, to measure efficiency, but quick turnaround in things like traffic citations and tax collection. So uh, that's really helping the government be more efficient. And what that means for the citizens is you know that's that's money that's being well spent on the on the services that they're that they're looking to provide as a government. Uh, also, see real performance enhancements, uh, uh, improvements for both the the state side and citizens in terms of how they can interact with with the the government. Yeah, so the kind of funny the innovation that I got to pay my fine quicker. That's right. Yeah. So, <laughs> all right, let's leave that <laughs> aside now for now. But uh, let me ask Chris Ramos here, right? Uh, how did transparency, collaboration, and citizen participation align with Jalisco's open source development model? And how can others learn from that? Sure. So I think one of the, the places to start is just that the state of Jalisco's position as a public entity, I mean, that just for one puts a lot of pressure on them to ensure that when they change, they do so right, and everything's done really well. Um, ultimately, the citizens are consumers, right? I mean, it's kind of the, uh, their customer they have to deal with and keep happy and keep their government working well. And as such, you know, working with citizens that are ultimately consumers, their demands and expectations are also going to evolve very rapidly. And so the state of Jalisco had to look for a way to, to set themselves up to both develop now and also uh, set them up for the future to be able to develop uh, just as fast and keep pace. Um, and I, I think if you uh, then also take a step back and just think, uh, to your point, when you're paying bills, right, there's uh, a level of trust that requires, a level of transparency that people want, especially if you're going to ask them to deviate from how they've interacted in the past. 
Um, you know, certainly if you're sending off a check or, or working with a new platform, you want to ensure that you know, everything's going to work out as you expect. Um, and I think if you just take a step back and then think about what other people can learn from this example, I think the first and foremost is the fact that they recognize a pretty big need to change and just transform as an organization. And they also recognize that given their demands both to change now and also in the future, um, it, they thought it was important to use open solutions to uh, ultimately take advantage of the innovation in the industry today, but also provide them flexibility for the future and avoid any lock or anything like that. Uh, and I think another thing that was very important that they did is they recognized up front that they wanted to make sure they did get it right and they picked the right mix of products. Um, and, and also that when they made that change, their developers would be prepared uh, to hit the ground running and be successful again, now and in the future. And to do that, I think one thing that, that paid benefits to them is they worked up front with the Red Hat consulting and training team to do so. Uh, so ultimately, I think what caught my eye about this winner more than anything is the fact that there was a significant change undertaken. I mean, just the, the sheer magnitude of the change. But more importantly, when you look at uh, the results at the end, and some of the statistics that Chris shared were really impressive. And I think ultimately, you saw where they made a big change and they got really big results at the end. Yeah, it's, it's great to see those stats, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Chris, yeah. Let's go back to Chris Wright, right? In the, the, what, what aspects of this strategy did you admire or stood out as the most impressive in, der, in terms of industry best practices? Well, I think a key tenet here is collaboration and, and the, the notion uh, of transparency, uh, collaboration, and then citizen en citizenship engagement, which I think are uh, really the tenets of, of what we're talking about here in terms of open source and, and bringing together ideas. One of the things that the uh, Jalisco government is doing is really building a platform so that they can move ahead and not be left behind with technology changes. And this kind of forward-looking activity has, has earned them the title of Silicon Valley of, of Mexico, which I think is, is, a, is a really great way to look at it. Uh, they were trying to build themselves a core uh, engine for, for innovation. And that the traditional way of engaging with a supplier and getting proprietary solutions just isn't the answer today for how do you, how do you build yourself your, your innovation engine. And uh, you know, ultimately, there's further plans uh, to build uh, data centers, private cloud, and really, they're they're giving themselves the platform to expand into the future. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Chris. Yeah, let's let's transition a little bit here. And you know, like uh, you said, businesses really need the right tools to deploy managed IT elements like private cloud. You know, like including having the right software and the right management tools to do this, right? And technology like OpenStack can be a bit complex. I think we all agree on that, right? Uh, Ashesh, you know, like, what are the top reasons organizations are adopting private cloud solutions with OpenStack despite its complexity? And how does Rackspace meet their needs? Right. Well, it's a timely question, Marco, um, especially given um, OpenStack Summit is next mm -hmm. week in, in Boston. I'm sure many of you are planning to um, attend. Um, I think the past challenges of deploying OpenStack has been about matching um, customer expectations with mm -hmm. the maturity and, and where the technology has been. Um, and I think as the technology has matured, um, you know, customers are thinking less and less about just public cloud in a box, right? I think maybe that's where they first started. Uh, but increasingly more as a scale out elastic data center infrastructure mm -hmm. um, that can reduce cost, increase flexibility. Um, so I think that's been you know, really positive um, with regard to um, the adoption patterns that are happening around OpenStack, we're starting to see them. Um, Rackspace, of course, has been an early leader in the OpenStack community, um, just like Red Hat, right, have been uh, contributing significantly. Uh, organizations still need specialized IT resources so, to deploy and manage uh, OpenStack. Uh, and for the organizations um, you know, that don't necessarily have it or need assistance, um, Rackspace can certainly help uh, and manage this for them. So they've created a nice business model around uh, OpenStack to help several customers use it mm -hmm. and, and get a lot of value from it. Um, I think maybe one final point I want to make is that uh, Rackspace has partnered uh, pretty extensively with Red Hat in the OpenStack community. So again, you know, in the spirit of uh, collaboration that we've been talking about all morning, uh, but you know, that's really great to see. Um, so collaborating now uh, with Red Hat on end user adoption is extremely natural. Thank you, Ashesh, for the context. Uh, let's go, uh, you know, Chris, if I may ask you, right? Is, uh, 
Yeah, Red Hat has a strong partnership with Rackspace, and like, it's just as Shesh said, in, for a long time. And as Brian Thompson talked about in Tuesday's general session, right, we've worked together closely over the years to improve open source technology and provide those <coughs> tools for, for the enterprise IT. What can you tell us about the, the latest Red Hat and Rackspace collaboration that is the foundation for Rackspace private cloud uh, solution? Well, Rackspace worked together with Red Hat to develop the uh, Rackspace private cloud powered by Red Hat. And it's a Red Hat OpenStack platform-based solution combining other technologies like uh, Ceph and certainly RHEL and Satellite, uh, combining those technologies with Rackspace's uh, amazing expertise in managed, managing a, a cloud, a complex cloud uh, environment. And so this is a, a great combination of operational skills and technology, uh, really supporting the end customer's journey to the cloud. Uh, you know, and not all customers have the internal operational skills to bring the cloud uh, onto their premise. So working through a partnership with a supplier like, like Rackspace helps that customer build their journey to pl uh, platform for, for their innovation. So you know, giving them the, the place to build their business differentiation. I think some interesting things that have come out of this collabor collaboration and the solution that Rackspace has uh, is enabling uh, quick workflows. So things that may have uh, taken uh, in introduction of a new software version that may have taken upwards of 40, 45 days, bringing that down to something like three days. So dramatic improvement in, in how quickly you can update uh, software. And also, how do you create a, a, pr a production environment from scratch to fully functional, uh, certainly without, without uh, agile infrastructure that could take months? Uh, here we're talking about something including all of the different aspects like load balancing, network, com multiple nodes, uh, coming up in something on the order of seven, seven and a half minutes. So really rapid production environments that give you the ability to move quickly as you're building out your, uh, your solutions. And I think the, the way to look at it is simplifying uh, the, the private cloud and enabling all of that open source innovation uh, without sort of sacrificing any of the stability, security, really key mission critical underlying infrastructure that you need for uh, to run your enterprise. Yeah, it's great. Thank you, Chris. I love these stats, and you can see this is why these innovation awards are real, right? We, it's not just a, a marketing effort. It's really like we look at these details and we analyze them, right? And mm -hmm. and so let's uh, so this collaboration is a good example to other customers aiming to adopt a private cloud solution, looking for more integration with Red Hat. Um, Chris, is it? Well, it's a real, I mean, we're, it's a real partnership between uh, Rackspace and Red Hat, and I think the, the future of IT is so much about collaboration between vendors and customers, vendors and vendors together with customers, so this is, this is really how we're, we're building our next generation infrastructure. I love um, a quote from uh, Dan Shepard saying 50% of the Rackspace engineering team is Red Hat. So that is really just underscoring exactly the kind of collaboration that we're building together. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, and so together, actually, Red Hat and, and Open, uh, Rackspace have built, uh, com uh, contributed something about 27, 29% of the code base uh, upstream in the, in the OpenStack community. And with that, bringing together our solution to the customers, you're seeing um, things like 99.99% API SLAs guaranteed through, uh, from Rackspace. So this is the kind of, of enterprise uh, infrastructure that comes out of this uh, tight collaboration. Thank you, Chris. Now, let's transition again to the next uh, area, right? And, and uh, this week, we heard it a lot, right? Integration is obviously a big topic in IT. And it can be the integration of private cloud and public cloud resources, you know, this whole open hybrid cloud, but also the traditional challenge of balancing investments in the old IT versus in innovation, right? I mean, how do you balance that, right? And so this is the enterprise transformation category, which focus on organization that achieved and really showcase uh, using the agile and open practices 
to and, and technology to, to achieve that transformation. We've seen it over the years, and this year, uh, the win of the last category is Macquarie Banking Financial Services Group in Australia. We, you see, it, you saw it, uh, I think, on Tuesday or, or yesterday, right? They build a much smar smarter digital banking experience in their personal line online banking platform. You saw the apps yesterday in the movie, right? For their Australian retail consumers, right? They're continually evolving and improving the customer experience. So it's, it's a good example. Look, Chris, let me ask Chris Rommels one more time. Uh, mm -hmm. Can you share your thoughts on this story from Australia? Yeah, absolutely. So I think, again, one of the, the things that stood out to me was just the, uh, the magnitude of the change that was, that was undertaken and just the effort that they, they recognized they, they needed to, uh, to start. Uh, they were in a situation where the bank hadn't invested for quite a while. So they were stuck with a slew of, uh, of monolithic applications that they recognized they needed to uh, to update and start a process to do so. And, um, and also, in, in when they recognized that need to change, they also wanted to make sure that when they did change, they got started in a way that would ultimately uh, support a more agile and DevOps culture. Um, and from there, uh, I think one of the, the important things they did is that um, when they were looking at different solutions, uh, they found a partner in Red Hat that had both PaaS as well as uh, container solutions. Uh, but again, uh, just as in the, the state of Jalisco example, what, one thing they did is that they recognized that open technology, again, would provide them not only the, I guess, the source of innovation they needed to move forward, but also would provide them flexibility in the future. And with that, they ultimately selected Red Hat uh, OpenShift Container Platform, and that was as a public cloud uh, implementation and data center run by AWS. And I, I think one of the things that's really important here is that they wanted to pick a solution, but also just a partner. Again, just like uh, we were talking about just a moment ago, uh, they wanted to set up a model for transformation. So this was a case study in one part of the organization, but they wanted to be able to scale their success throughout the entire organization. Uh, and you know, ultimately, they were able to do so uh, when, when they uh, selected Red Hat after, you know, again, looking through what else was available to them. Uh, so just, again, take a, a step back here and uh, continue on the theme of you know, statistics tell truths here. Uh, and uh, one thing that, that really jumped out is that their developer productivity improved by over 50%. So once again, huge operational cost savings. Uh, but also just in terms of getting things done, they re their release time went from hours to just minutes. And so once again, this is about an organization recognizing a need to change. And, and in this case, a need to make some fast project uh, uh, progress to catch up. And once they made those big changes, those big investments, uh, they were able to not only save on their operational side for them, but transform ultimately the end customer experience, which is really what drives long-term success. Thank you, thank you. Now, let me uh, uh, thank you for everybody sure, for sharing the insights, right? We've learned you know, the benefits of being a risk taker within reason. That's why innovation award winners are here, right? And Adopting new open source technologies like OpenShift and other Red Hat solutions is a way to embrace innovation in a more agile, collaborative DevOps approach, right? And with obviously with the help that Red Hat can provide with expert support and guidance. Now, I, this is ask for you, right? Hopefully you get inspired. We always, when we get these studies, we get inspired and think it's like, Wow, this is really cool, right? What they did there and there, the public um, APIs and the government. This is really good to, to see and get inspired, hopefully, and be the disruptor, right? And you can cause change, right? In, if financial and government institution can do it, you can do it as well, right? And uh, you can turn competition into collaboration, work together, right? Be the individual who starts the ripple, ripple of change and the innovation in your org. Now, the Red Hat Innovation Award you know, celebrates and, uh, and recognizes the organization that use open source to solve business challenges. Out of these five winners, one is being voted from you as the audience here and, and uh, online to the innovator of the year. Now, let's go over here. There's only, the one, envelope, only one envelope. There's only one envelope, right? <laughs> yeah. So 2017 innovator of the year is is this the real one? <laughs> Rackspace.
Congratulations, Brian. Yeah, yeah. Good. Congratulations, yeah, awesome. Congratulations, yeah. Congratulations, yeah. Congratulations, 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 yeah. I think they're making pictures somewhere, yeah. I think so, oh, there we go, uh, uh. All right, so take this away, so be bold. We want to see you up here next year, or we want to see your story. Keep out for the nomination. This is opening next year. Talk to a Red Hat person if you want to be part of this. Submit your stories. We really want to see you. So thank you for attending the morning keynote. We'll see you back in the afternoon, and be the force with you.